So what we what we have now is a a tour of some of the facilities and some of the and so you can see some of the science that happens at the at at Stone Lab. So if you're not familiar with a field station, they are typically remote to or at least remote to central to a central campus and they study the particular ecology and environment of a given area or region. And part of that is also the human impact on the environment and the ecology. And then baked into that is also the is the education and outreach that comes with being with a land grant uh, mission. So, uh, Justin, do you want to say anything before that we start the video, or just want to throw them in? No, I'm gonna say go ahead and start the video. Um, okay. And we are uh, stone. I I haven't seen all the video, but um, uh, Stone Lab is the first freshwater biological field station in at least in the United States. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we date back to uh, the late 1800s. Okay. Let me... Okay. Do you see it? Yep. I see the video. Wait. Share. So I'm not. I'm not are you hearing the sound? I, I don't. Well, there's no sound at the very beginning. It, it, oh, okay. Or you hear anything. Hi, my name's Justin Chaffin. I'm the research coordinator at Ohio State University Stone Lab. Uh, we are located on South Bass Island in Lake Erie. Uh, my job title is a research coordinator and I specialize in harmful algal blooms uh, in Lake Erie and now we're doing some projects in inland lakes. Um, the harmful algal blooms are a type of algae that can produce toxins and my projects focus on what causes the blooms to grow and what causes them to produce toxins and we're using that information to alert water treatment plants that pull in water that need to remove the algae and remove the toxins so they can produce safe drinking water. How we do this, we we'd, uh, do a combination of, of field sampling. So we're out here on the research fossil today. We'll grab samples from the lake and process them and get data that way. We also do experiments where we'll get water from the lake that has algae, take it to the lab, incubate it with extra phosphorus or extra nitrogen uh, at different temperatures and see how the harmful algal blooms respond in terms of growth and toxin production. There's two ways we get data from the lake. Uh, one is through deployed instruments. So you see a buoy behind us. That buoy has a water quality sensor that is constantly taking water temperature, water pH, turbidity, uh, the amount of ox oxygen, also the amount of algae and amount of harmful algal blooms. That is constantly recording data. The data gets beamed to the internet and anyone can download in real time. We also grab water samples, which we'll demonstrate here next, uh, where we'll grab water sample, process it, and take it to the lab and get more detailed data, such as how many, uh, what type of algae are present, are there toxins present, what are the nutrients that are in the water, how much sediments are in the water, so we're going to demonstrate that now. One way we collect water from the lake is using a device called an integrated tube sampler. Uh, this will give us a sample from the surface down to two meters. And it gives a good representation of what's happening at the surface. We simply don't want to throw a bucket over the, over the water, over the edge, and scoop up surface water because it might be a little biased. If it's calm, we might have a lot of algae floating at the surface. If it's rough, that algae might be fixed further down. So we want to get a nice slice of the entire water column. That's how this works, we're going to lower, the, lower it into the lake, nice and slowly. Then I'm going to cap it. And this is analogous to like putting your um, a straw in a glass of water, putting your finger on the straw and pulling it out. The water remains in the straw. Water is going to remain in the sampler. It's only 
cord's out. So now we're going to test the water sample for for microcystins, which are the, the main toxins that the sound bacteria produce. This project, um, or this device we're working on, is a new instrument that will allow us to get toxin data in 20 minutes. The normal method of uh, analyzing for microcystins takes about four, four to five hours, whereas this will give us data in about 10 minutes. So the first step is to lyse the samples or to break open the cells. One of our projects that we're working on is testing a rapid microcystin test. Um, you know, the, the normal microcystin test takes four to five hours and has to be done in the lab. But we're working with this company based in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, that's developing um, a rapid test that'll get data within 20 minutes. So the first step of the product, the first step of the of the method is to break open the cells, which we did. It takes 10 minutes. And then next, we are going to put 100 microliters of, of the sample onto a cartridge here. This cartridge has all of the same chemicals that the standard lab test has. So the, the next step is to add the, the, the lice sample to the reagent, which you see Autumn here doing now, pipetting the water and the reagents together. And then once that's mixed, she will add it to uh, the cartridge She's adding the sample to the cartridge, and then she will pop it into a reader, which then takes 10 minutes. All right, now this, the sample will take 10 minutes. A couple of the, of the research projects that we're, that we're working on are, are funded by NOAA through their EcoHab program and their MirHab program. The, the MirHab program is the one that I talked about using the rapid microsystem tester. Uh, we're doing that to get a lot of data. So we need a lot of data in the lake to populate our models that are, which is the second project that we're working on is funded by the EcoHab uh, program, where we're taking all the data from the lake, putting it into a model and trying to forecast uh, harmful algal bloom toxins several days in advance, the water treatment plants, beach managers, uh, general tourists have an early warning or an early idea of how many toxins will be in the lake at that given time. The test is finished. Uh, the microcystin concentration was 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. Um, that's pretty typical for this time in Lake Erie in the Western Basin in the late August. We've seen much higher. Uh, the, sw the swimming advisory is six micrograms per liter. So the water here is still perfectly fine to swim in, perfect kind of uh, fine to swim fish. Um, this also, what I did mention earlier, this um, test also does a second toxin called Slindospermopsin, which we do not see very often in Lake Erie or in the state of Ohio. But this instrument does have a potential to do, or it does do two toxins at once. Just for our purposes, we're only concerned about microcystins because we will never see, or hopefully we'll never see slonospermopsins. So then what we would do, we would take that sample we collected, take to the lab and do the gold standard ELISA test. So we can compare a 0 0.8 from the n bile unit to what we would get in the lab. Okay, this is the wet lab where we bring all the water samples that we just collected for processing. Um, in this lab, we're studying the harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie, which are hats in Lake Erie. Currently, there is a 
NOAA has bulletin that comes out that tells everyone that predicted amount of algae, but we don't know uh, the top amount of the toxin the algae would create. And it's the microcystis toxin, and it's a liver toxin. So when that's in our drinking water, it creates do not drink advisories. So one of the things we're trying to do is find a way to predict how much, how to tell where that toxin will be and how much of that toxin will be there. Um, so when we get our water samples back from the, water, uh, from the lake, the first thing we'll do is filter them, and we will use these filters. These filters right here, they're kind of like coffee filters. So a good analogy that my boss would use would be if you're making a cup of coffee, all the coffee grounds will be on the top of the filter, which in this case would be our total nutrient sample. And then what goes through the filter will be our uh, dissolved nutrient sample or the chemicals that are in the water that the algae uses for food. So this machine is our flow cam. Traditionally, when we want to know what kind of uh, phytoplankton is in the lake, we would have to sit under a microscope and have someone ID it, which it takes a long time and it's not the most fun job. So not a lot of people will do that job. So this machine, uh, you pour your plankton sample through this tube and it comes down to this section right here where it has a, a microscope lens so it'll magnify the sample and there's also a camera in there so it'll take photos of the sample as it's being pulled through. Um, it takes about 20 photos a second and then the computer will automatically sort your algae based on type. So this is our pass cube machine. Um, this machine is used to find out how much of the microcystin toxin is in our lake samples. So we will pre-treat the samples by free-sawing them to lyse the cells, and then we will have the machine pipette a certain amount of each sample into this 96 well plate. And then it will pipette reagents, which will cause a color change if the microcystin toxin is present. And it will be able to read how much of the color changed and let us know how much of the toxin is in our sample. This is our nutrient analyzer. So the filtered samples that we had collected in the lake will come in here and we'll analyze them for five different nutrients. We have nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, silica and phosphate. Um, we're most concerned with the nitrogen and the phosphorus for the Lake Erie samples because those are chemicals that the algae will use to grow. So the way this works is it will collect an aliquot of sample and it will automatically add reagents at a certain time. And these reagents, so for example with phosphate, if there's phosphate present in the sample, it will turn blue. And the more phosphate that's in the sample, the more blue it will turn. So when these are finished incubating, they will come up here to the top of the machine and be read by a spectrophotometer, um, which will be able to tell us how much phosphate is in the water based on how blue it is.
sample checklist so we just go through this and make sure we have all the sample bottles for that um, this is for the Secvita screening which we took out there I will show you how to do pour A right now that's the most hands on one these actually um, don't get ran right away so I can do it Side and there's like a side that's kind of like irregular. Um, 
this looks like your inside. It's hard to tell. So you're going to put it just flat on here like that. And these are magnetic. So you want sides up and it's going to be dipped down a little. You just want to be eye level and read it where the lowest point of the water is. And so yeah, I'll show you. Before it, but... Yep. All right. It's not full. I'm just trying to pull it um, yeah. so, And then once it starts here, it's happy. You don't want to bend down and look at eye level for the meniscus. Sometimes hard to tell, but it will dip down like in the middle like this. So you just yeah. want to make sure the lowest point is hitting the line, which you did good. So that's good. Okay, so we'll turn this on. You're just gonna pour this in there um, slowly. And it will go through. You can fill it up and then like let it drain back down and then refill it if you need to. Right now we'll be able to do a whole liter, but when the water has on the bottom, just one thin layer covering the bottom. That's good. So 
little shake to even them out. Perfect. Not that one. That's just the top. So just okay. the bottom of that one. That's good. And then I'll give you this back. If you could pull this out. So this, what we're testing is in the middle. So you want to make sure to grab the edges and not get any of the greenish part. It's not so great to it. Perfect. And then lay that on there. Awesome. And then we just cap it and put it in the freezer until it's ready for analysis. You want your sample to be room temp. So if it was cold, you just let it sit for a while. That should be good today. And then you take that over here. It's going to take a minute to get the sample done. And this shines the light through it and reflects back, and it's able to measure like different types of algae, like green, blue green, diatoms. So they get this started. So what you want to do is simple DI water, just organized water, um, and that this is very delicate. And you don't want to touch the glass panels because you don't want any sponges on it. So when you're picking it out, just make sure to keep it inside. just to rinse out if you bet. And just kind of twist it around. Yeah, that's that's a bad sign. Sign. I think this isn't the right. Hold it like this. So now you can pour sample 25 ml mark. And then you have to give this. This one's not as good, but that's good. And then I take a pin wipe, and this is where you can touch the side. So I just wipe them down, get the water and sponges off, and See that thing spinning the sample around in there? Yeah. Okay, so now it's going to start reading that as you can see these numbers. So we want to get at least five um, consistent readings with no outliers, transfer fair data. If there is outliers, we'll take those out later. So you're just looking at these numbers to make sure they're all pretty similar to each other, which they look like they are. Besides maybe the 28, I would get rid of that one. But one, two, three, four, five, and then that's it. You just press stop, and that's all your data. And see up here we have green algae, blue green, diatoms, cryptophyta, etc., and then total concentration, which is 1.04. <coughs> Not a lot at all, as you can tell because the water is so clear right now. Well, what you see in the film is that lab work is not always glamorous and takes an awful lot of patience. 
and things don't always work out the way you intend. Uh, thanks. So if so, if we have any questions, you can put them in the chat. I have a question. Um, I, instead of typing it, I'll just say it. Go ahead. So you talked about the presence of the toxin creating harm, um, harm in like the level of drinking water. And I know you measured it with phytoplankton, but are there other like harmful ecological effects from the presence of the toxin besides just drinking water? Do they hurt okay. phytoplankton? Yes. Oh uh, yeah, you can. Uh, uh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My my headset's it's funny. Um. Yeah. There's a a bunch of ecological effects, both direct and indirect. Um. Uh. We we also know that they produce a lot of other compounds besides microcystins, uh, that we don't quite know about. Um. They they if they affect um, um, anything with a liver is, is one of the main things. So uh, uh, when when small fish uh, uh, when the baby fish are exposed to microcystins in labs, they they have liver failure. Um, but fortunately, uh, in Lake Erie, there's a disconnect from when the baby fish are present and when the blooms are present. And also, uh, uh, the the types of fish that are more tolerant to the blooms, such as catfish and sunfish, they do well in warm water. Warm water, whereas um, walleye, perch, uh, the smallmouth bass, that would be more impacted by it. They tend to migrate to the deeper parts of the lake to find cooler water. So, so fortunately, there's a disconnect there. Um, Looking at the zooplankton, um, the, there's some new research showing that microcystis, um, not not necessarily microcystin, but some other type of compound they're producing, causes zooplankton to reproduce earlier, uh, which you might find there's often you find a lot of zooplankton went in a bloom, but that's because it's causing the zooplankton to reproduce faster. But then that second generation is much less fertile than the initial generation. So it causes them to make babies, but then the babies can't uh, reproduce as well. Um, uh, the blooms, they form high biomasses. When they die and sink to the bottom, uh, that consumes oxygen. And you can have areas of water that have low or no oxygen, which then smothers um, benthic invertebrates, benthic fish either suffocate or they have to swim up in the water column, which uh, exposes them to more predation or they have to swim somewhere else. Um, so th there's, a, there's a lot of impacts besides just the human health. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but those are just some examples. Actually, do, actually, do we know what the microcystine is doing for the cyanobacteria? Like why, why is it producing it? That, that's a good question. And uh, a lot of theories have been put out. Um, a lot of them debunked. It's the, the earlier one is that it was a um, defense against grazing molecule. Um, however, if you look at the genes, uh, the, micro, the genes to produce microcystin predate any metazoan gene. So cyanobacteria were producing microcystins well before anything was trying to eat them. Uh, so that rules that out. Uh, the current uh, theory is that it aids in um, high light tolerance. So microcystis likes to float at the surface where it's exposed to high sunlight. And when they, when, photosyn when um, uh, algae are exposed to high sunlight, they tend to uh, get sloppy with photosynthesis and pre and create reactive oxygen species. So microcystin might be a way for them to um, stabilize their protein structure in high oxidative uh, environment. That's the current um, theory. Other ones are that it's, um, it, it could be a, a way for cyanobacteria cells to somewhat communicate with each other. Um, when, 
a microcystin is not excreted from a cell. It's held within a cell. But if the cell dies, if it gets attacked by virus or uh, it runs out of nutrients, the you know, cells die eventually, and they and they really they release their gut. Um, it has been shown that other cyanobacteria cells can detect when microcystin is present in the water. So it might be an indicator like, hey, things are getting bad, prepare for um, rough times. But uh, the oxidative stress seems to be a more uh, sound um, hypothesis right now. But again, we, we don't know. Um, if you take that microcystin gene and um, knock it out, so if you have a, tox a cell that can produce toxins, if you remove that gene, it does fine. It still grows. Um, there's strands that produce toxins, strands that don't. And then even if you have all the genes, they might not be uh, actively producing the toxin. So there is some benefit to it. We just um, don't uh, know uh, exactly yet. That's a good question. <laughs> Actually, and Danny's actually reminding me that there's a small library in Stone at Stone Lab. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I think the librarian is also here. Is that Florian Diekman? Yeah. Um, it, it's a small library. We have college courses up here. Um, and during summer, they request books. But we can also get re books requested from uh, I guess they come from the main campus. I wish you, I, I don't know, but um, the, the library is uh, probably a 10 by 12 room, uh, textbooks and textbooks and journal articles, um, all devoted to aquatic sciences. Um, there's also a, uh, a uh, old, um, I don't know if we call it a library or not, but uh. Uh, an old repository of old manuscripts and and reports in our research in the second story of our research building. Uh, there's reports that date back to the 1920s up there in uh, um, old paper. It's, um, it would be useful for someone to go through and you know take those because they kind of just sit there. I don't know if they're available online or not. Um, I believe there's a Dewey Decimal <laughs> card catalog up there. <laughs> okay. yeah, I was going to ask if, if they're scanned. Are these are these papers like research that's been done at the station, or are these student like student papers that they did for classes? Um, both. Um, it might from uh, several directors ago. You know, going back into the '60s, he, I think he just started a, a library of what papers he could find, so he would print them. But there's also work, you know, I, I don't know if it's, there's definitely stone lab directors and professors work there, but I believe there's also other papers up there as well that might be Ohio related or funded by Ohio. And then how many, how many, how many students do you, or do you have there? In the summer, um, we have. Uh, I'm assuming we we have one week classes. Year. Yes, yeah. uh, so we'll have one week classes. Um, those one week classes can have up to sixteen students. So at a given time, on Stone Lab, I think we can hold up to sixty students. Uh, that's our dorm capacity right now. Uh, those students might be here for a week. They might be uh, graduate level students. They might be undergrad or um, college or um, high school students looking for college credit. Uh, so they might be here for one week at a time, four weeks or six weeks at a time. And they, you, you can take a four week class and then another four week class or a one week and a one week. Um, so it, it kind of varies, um, but general up to 60. Uh, the college students we normally have during our main session, uh, I'd say around 30 to 30 to 40 ish college students on the island at a time. And then uh, how many researchers do you support at the, at, or does that also fluctuate during the season? Uh, that, that also fluctuates. So 
we, we have visiting researchers that I talked about in my presentation. We'll, uh, we'll you know, up to 50 or 60 per year. Uh, we have a group of, um, a group from Kent State here today. Uh, last week, we had a group from Wright State and from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, in two weeks, we're having researchers from uh, North Carolina and Tennessee visit. Um, uh, so we, we have those researchers who come and go. Uh, we also had OSU PhD students who uh, stay in our, our cottages for a week or for the entire summer doing their uh, uh, research. Um, we had, we've had grad students from other universities stay with us for the entire summer. Um, our, our staff, uh, you saw in the video, Kira, who was talking first, uh, she's been with us since 2016. And we've had um, Autumn, who is the, the taller redhead uh, since, since last year. And then the, the other girl in the video was a high school shadow. Oh, oh so she just happened to come on the day she was doing a, um, the filming. Uh, so it was good to show her. Um, it, it was good for the video and good to walk her through step by step. So I saw in the comment that, you know, it's a good, good step by step uh, instruction. Um, so it just happened to work out that we were showing uh, that high school shadow how to do these things and while filming it. Uh, but in, in general, you know, our, um, you know, that's, that's our research. Um, we, have, we also have Dr. Kristen Stanford, who does the Lake Erie water snake. Uh, she'll have um, uh, assistance throughout the year and uh, snake researchers coming up, coming up throughout the year too. Oh, and there's a question. Are there any international collaborations? Yeah. Um, um, we've had students from, uh, like I mentioned that first presentation from uh, four other countries coming. Uh, we had a student from Brazil up here for, uh, I think she was here during the college term. So she was here for eight weeks. Um, she was, uh, she was just wanting to get more experience on a large lake, um, exactly what she was doing. Um, or, you know, it, that's all I kind of got from it. She just wanted more experience being on a lake. So she just, just tagged along with a lot of the class field trips. Um, but her project was uh, um, on, on water quality in Brazil. And she went along with the water quality sampling trips that we did. Um, uh, we had a couple um, students from Canada come down um, with projects. Um, I have Canadian collaborators where, uh, well, you know, one thing about Lake Erie, it's there's a border that runs right down the middle. And uh, we don't take our vessels into Canadian waters because, mm. you know, of all the paperwork of taking students and OSU vehicles out of, out of the country, <laughs> it's a hassle. You know, it's just water. There's nothing there to cross. Um, but we work with a Canadian, um, uh, the Canadian version of the uh, EPA, the um, uh, Ca uh, Environment Canada and Climate Change and their Ministry of Natural Resources. So you know, we work with them. Uh, uh, the North Carolina group often brings their Chinese collaborators. Uh, one of the large lakes in China, Lake Taihu, uh, it's about the size of a little bit smaller than the Western Basin, but they have terrible blooms. Um, so, so they work with us. Um, you know, we also had researchers from uh, New Zealand uh, study benthic algae up here for a week. So yeah, there, there are international collaborations. I'm trying to build it. Um, yeah, yeah, while you mentioned that, next year we're hosting, um, um, you, you, you know, uh, conferences often, you know, people go to a conference and they sit there and listen to presentations. Well, there's a group uh, that meets like every other year or every third year. Uh, they call themselves a group of aquatic primary, group of primary productivity or, or GAP for short. And they, every third year or every fourth year, uh, they get together at a various location 
and um, for for 10 days to two weeks they they do uh, uh the first two days are presentations and then they do research for seven days and then the last two days they present the research so it's kind of a conference workshop um but we're expecting visitors from uh, all over the globe uh, to come to stone lab for two weeks next year and i'm also a co-host of the uh international conference of toxic sound bacteria that's going to occur in toledo next year well you know we're working with researchers from all over to be on our our committees for that so yeah, we do do a lot of um, international uh collaborations i'm trying to build it um you know as i build my collaboration portfolio i will you know expand on it okay yeah thank you um there's a question about invasive algae species showing up in Lake Erie that might cause future problems. So do you know? Yeah, um, most of the algae that we deal with are native. Um, they're bacteria, or the sound bacteria, most of them are native. There are a few invasive ones. The lingbia, which grows on the bottom, that's an invasive one. Uh, there's another one called cylindospermopsis. Uh, we're on the lookout for that. Uh, we found it in Sandusky Bay, so it's already here. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't win versus what's already here. Um, so what's in Sandusky Bay, uh, the planktothrix tends to tends to kick everything else's butt. And the same thing with microcystis out in the main lake. Um, there is one type of diatom that everyone should be concerned about. Um, uh, called didiospemia, but it's also called rock snot for short. Um, it's pretty bad in um, um, trout streams because it gets tracked along in waders. And when it takes over, the um, rocks just look like they're covered in snot. So that's uh, one to keep an eye out. It, it doesn't occur out in lakes. It's a, it's a river one. It needs flowing current. Um, but that's one that we're, uh, we're, we're concerned about. Hey, Tom, I noticed that Florian um, uh, went, went live just a little uh, bit. Yes. Give him the floor. Yeah, hi, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm Florian Dickman. I'm the uh, uh, liaison librarian, um, one of the liaison librarians to the College of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and I'm kind of assigned to the Stone Lab, um, Stone Lab Library. Uh, Danny put me on the on the spot here a little bit. There's there's really too much to add to uh, to this. As Justin said, it is um, uh, currently really just a, a one room um, library on one side. Um, we have a course reserve collection, and um, we have maybe um, Justin would probably know the number, but 10, 10 15 courses that pre pandemic that 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 we offered. And then I will basically email um, the the instructors of, of that those courses um, early in the year and say you know I'm you're teaching this class and these were the class you know the the, the textbooks or courses of items that you had requested in the past and do, are you still um, interested in those do you want to add things do you want to move things and so we get we get a list back and then um, we have a, um, a a bit of a an assistant, so that's typically some some of the research staff, some of the students that are kind of assigned to the library, and we go out there, make everything ready, um, and train that student, um, and then basically she she brings um, everything down to the classroom ahead of the class, collects everything at the end, make sure everything is there, and then uh, we all come back at um, at the end of the year and, and make an inventory and make sure um, they're good good shape for for next year. So typically we do two trips up there. Um, and it's a bit, um, you know, it's um, it's a bit of a um, adventure to go up there um, because we don't do this that often. So it's it's a drive, three hours. Um, you have to hop on a ferry and then um, you go across the island and then you meet the uh, research station um, staff, the Stone Lab staff, and then they, um, you know, start the boat and then you go over to Jubat Island and then you get up to the, to the library. Um, I just lost my uh, uh, library manager. I'm also head of the Food Agriculture and Science Library here. 
and uh, she moved on to a different position. And we discussed what, what she really liked about working here. And one of the things was the trips to Stone Lab because you know we, we were lots of you know plenty of time to to talk. And then you know went over the um, the island like Erie, and it was just something um, we we have we have have used on occasion to kind of. Um, not reward staff, but you know, some you know, on occasion I take st students with me um, and that, that have an interest in that that collection. But yeah, it, it is really um, just a, a course reserve collection. There's a reference collection on the other side that that is not really um, used. I mean, most of the content is available electronically, and um, so that's that, that's probably to be expected. The um, the research papers collection that Justin mentioned in the research building. We really don't have anything to do with that. Maybe I should pay more attention to that. Um, but um, the the library went through multiple iterations, and it, it used to be a really a large large operation. It was really uh, a, quite a logistical effort. I understand from previous librarians to, to manage that from from the distance, but it has been um, scaled down. You know, to, to really just the one. One library that houses, of course, reserve collection. It's it's still two trips a year, but um, yeah. So that the chase is is this helpful? <laughs> that, that sounds Definitely. like a fun assignment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's great. We like it. <laughs> Let's see, are there any other questions? There's a question about year-round residents. Is there anyone who is there to keep an eye on the facilities? And I just wondered if you live on South Bass Island year-round. Yeah, I when I was first hired uh, at OSU, I uh, lived in our staff housing for two or three years year-round, and then I I moved in with a um, a friend who teaches at the high school at Point Bay for two years and then I eventually moved off island. Uh, so I, I take the ferry over every day. Um, during the winter, I um, I fly up on a Monday and I stay in our staff housing through through a Friday. And then the and then the following week I'll work from home. So the the working from home adjustment during COVID was really easy for me because I've been doing it for the past several years uh, during the winter. Um, uh, we have probably seven or eight staff who are up here year round, nine or so. Um, some of our, our staff are local island residents. Um, they either live on South Bass or, 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 or Middle Bass Island. Um, and they bring their boat over, um, every day. Um. Yeah, so we have a couple year-round residents, uh, staff that live on the island as their main home. And then uh, I, our lab, our lab manager, Kevin Hart, and our assistant director, Brian Alford, uh, we come over um, about every other week during the winter. And if the lake is frozen over, you have to fly in? <laughs> yep. Yeah, we fly. And so the... Uh, the one of the grants we projects we have which wasn't mentioned it was briefly shown in the video but not mentioned um we, we have a year-round mercury atmospheric mercury monitoring program and kevin and i used to run it while we lived up here but then neither of us can afford to live here unless you, you know you're renting cheap with a buddy or living in staff housing uh, you know which isn't ideal um so once you know, we told them, we told EPA, like, hey, we need funds to fly over every other week to keep this instrument going. So, so that's nice that we, we got our winter travel covered by a, by a research grant because um, it wouldn't be possible to, to keep that operating with um, somebody not here each week. Okay, are there... Are there any other pre any other questions? Not a question, but I, I posted a, a link to the webcams. They have webcams in, in different um, buildings up there, and you, you have a really nice idea of 
the, the views they enjoy every day. And um, from, from going around on your webpage, it looks like you offer science excursions to, to the general public. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so normally, non-COVID, pre-COVID, uh, fall and or spring and fall, we, we normally offer field trips for grades 5 through 12. And revenues from that really allows us to hire um, all our seasonal staff. Um, and that seasonal staff then supports our summer college courses. Without that, during the spring, this uh, spring 2021, we couldn't hire staff for summer 2021. And quite frankly, we didn't know what we were going to be able to do. You know, in, a in April, we didn't know what we were going to do in, in May. So we, OSU allowed us to have up group groups up to 10. This is back in, you know, what we're doing back in uh, March and April. So he, they said we can do groups up at 10. Um, everyone's got to wear masks back then. They said, um, uh, so we offered these excursions to just, you know, help us get our numbers up to where they should be. So, uh, uh, yesterday there was a, a family of four that wanted to go out on the science cruise. So, you know, they, they pay and then they can hop on our boats and do a science cruise, same science cruise we would do for the field trip group. We, <laughs> we offer to the general public it has, it has to be pre-arranged you can't just show up knocking on the door with um asking to go but um yeah we we do various various types of excursions that that's our um, efforts to keep us busy um get numbers through the program through our outreach program um you know so we can tell osu and ohio sea grant or the sea grant network in general that hey, we're still doing stuff and, and we, we try to do these virtual things, um, but uh, in-person is much better. Yes, I agree. So, okay, that's it. We're at 4.30 now. Is there any other questions? Going once, okay. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for coming. And I'll turn it back over to Danny. I think we still have wrap up this afternoon, right? Thank you so much for your time, Justin.